Hello, I'm John Eldridge, and welcome to the Ransomed Heart audio podcast. For more information on Ransomed Heart Ministries, our resources, and events, please visit us online at www.ransomedheart.com. Friends, welcome back to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. I'm John Eldridge, and with me, Craig McConnell. We are nearing the end of a series on interpretation, interpreting life, interpreting your world. And it's been awesome. It's been phenomenal. Loving it. We've been talking about relational issues and how to interpret those. And Craig, for this podcast, you had an idea that I thought was pretty creative and insightful. What's on your mind? Yeah. Uh, Can I say the word bitchin'? You can. Okay. I kind of titled this in my mind, Interpreting Everything Being Bitchin'. I just was going through a bunch of storage in our house and found one of my daughter's high school annuals, and she's 30 now, and she hadn't seen it, and I hadn't seen it for quite a while. I was just reading through it. It was just a crack up, you know, Megan, have a bitch in summer, yeah. you know, <laughs> and uh, so that's where that word came from. But, John, I think, you know, we've talked about interpreting the chaos inside our emotions, interpreting God, um, the way he's working, his silence, his apparent non-engagement, disappointment, suffering, relational issues. And it felt like recalling my years as a pastoral counselor, working with people, a congregation that happened to be upper middle class, white, And for most of them, life was really, really good. And out of because of the life being bitchin', life being good, they had no need of God, nor were they particularly deep in their walk with God. And so it just felt like a word needed to be said. How do we interpret our lives when things are well, when things are good, when there doesn't seem to be relational conflict, when circumstances seem really rich and there's money in the checkbook, the health is good, kids are behaving, the marriage you're enjoying, the job seems fulfilling, and frankly, you don't know why people get off bitching and crabbing and moaning and groaning. It's like your life is going well. How are you to interpret a wonderful life? Or maybe to divide that into two categories, interpreting life when things seem to be good. Bingo. And interpreting those people who just refuse to face reality. Mm -hmm. Because you're describing two different kinds of experience, I think, comes to mind. I mean, yes, yes, we go through seasons of life where – we're under God's blessing. I'm thinking of that Matt Redmond song, Blessed Be the Name, right? Mm-hmm. And Blessed be the name when the sun is shining, right? And yes. the grace is flowing, right? And everything is as it ought to be. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Like, you betcha. Give thanks. Rejoice. Blow the trumpet. Celebrate. <laughs> dance. <laughs> exactly. Uncork a bottle of wine. But, Craig, I think the reason that you brought this up was that there are an awful lot of people out there that – are interpreting life as fine. Everything's fine. Things are great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When in fact, that's actually not the truth at all. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think the goal or the evidence of a good life is an absence of conflict. I think Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. In this world, you have tribulation. I think. In a world at war, in a world where there's so many unseen and unnamed realities that just surround us, that I think a peace, a calm, a season of blessing that doesn't acknowledge and isn't grateful, that is uninformed or unreflective, that's not really a peace. This is huge. This is huge because you're tapping into several things we need to take very, very slowly. Hang with us, gang. This is actually maybe one of the most important podcasts we've done. Craig, first, you said that the absence of conflict 
or whatever that may be. The presence of a seeming peace, tranquility, all is well, might not be the reflection of a godly life at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, friends, (laughs) pause. Did you hear that? Because I think we think it is. I sure know an awful lot of people who think it is Mm -hmm. that, you know, if you can just find that sweet place with God, if you can just find that blessedness, you know, if if relationships are bad, (laughs) withdraw from them. You don't need those people in your life. If, Mm -hmm. you know, you you don't like your current church and it's not bringing you to a great place, hey, man, there's a lot of options and so on and so forth. What they seem to be living from is that the absence of conflict is the proof of a godly life Mm -hmm. and a blessed life. Mm -hmm. But you and I have both dealt with clueless people. Mm -hmm. You know, usually it's marriage counseling, and usually there's the one spouse that's saying, hey, it's not okay. Things are not okay. I'm miserable. I'm (laughs) furious. You know, and they drag the other one in, and the other spouse just kind of sits there going, what? What's the issue? You know, this is Psalm 73 where the writer is looking at the wicked, and he's saying, I don't get it. They seem fine. They seem happy with their life. They don't seem to have troubles and pressures. You know, pause. Thus, the evidence right there is the absence of troubles and pressures does not indicate the blessing of God. It it could be narcissism. It could be total self-absorption. It could be a, a very hedonistic, selfish lifestyle under the guise of Christianity, you know? Yeah, life's great for them because they just blow off any sort of internal reflection, you know, etc. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a real peace, a real sense of blessing and satisfaction comes with the acknowledgement that, gosh, the world is at war and I have peace. I'm so grateful. But there's there's just an awareness and an honesty, a reflective willingness to say, despite the chaos in my internal world, I have found a peace. Yeah. Despite a world at war that is lying down a greased pole to hell, I have found a comfort and a rock, a fortress. It's a tempered, seasoned rooted in God in the midst of realities which are for every man, no matter what your circumstances and state. I mean, these are just true. Yeah. I'm getting worked up. I know. I'm lathered. I know. Because (laughs) why? Why? Because one, I don't think I'm being clear, and this is really important. (laughs) And? I'm not sure. Help me. I think you and I share a frustration at the unreflective person. There we go. I think that there are just so many Christians who are actually causing suffering in the lives of other people by their own self-absorption, by their self-centeredness. Yeah, their life's great, but it's great because, one, they're not in the battle. Mm -hmm. I just want to say, hey, gang, if you're not getting shot at, it's because you're not in the battle. And I have people kind of respond to us. This has been since the beginning of Ransomed Heart. You didn't get these little looks or phone calls or emails or you know, little conversations at conferences. People pull you aside and say, I think you're making too much of warfare. And I just immediately ask, well, tell me your experience. <laughs> and typically what they say is, I don't really experience that. And go, oh, really? Well, tell me about your involvement in advancing the kingdom. Silence. I mean, crickets. yeah, crickets. It's like, Sure, you can live a life of, quote, peace. Just get out of the battle, Mm -hmm. right? Be Mm -hmm. a narcissist. Withdraw. Be a hermit. Get out of relationship. You know, just insulate your world Mm -hmm. and call it Christian Mm -hmm. because you're having peace. Mm -hmm. The fact is that there's nothing godly about it. You're not in the war. Yeah. And so heads up, part of what we're trying to say is interpreting good times Be very careful that you don't establish this kind of this unspoken idea that, you know, to be a godly Christian, to be living a blessed life is to have no conflict. Mm -hmm. That's just not biblical. Mm -hmm. By the way, this is going to be an enormous relief for the mature saints who are listening to this, who are going, oh, my gosh, thank you for saying that. Because, you know, 
I do have people in my life where sir seems to be going great for them. Yeah. And, and it's not going great for me. I got all kinds of relational conflict, internal conflict, spiritual battles. You yes. know, life on this planet can be brutal. And you begin to feel guilty when actually those people, they're either extraordinarily naive mm-hmm. and they're just living in la la land mm-hmm. or they're narcissists, mm-hmm. they're hedonists. They're self-absorbed. The reason life is, quote, working for them is they're choosing not to engage in the difficult arenas of love or God or, you know, fighting the battles they're supposed to fight. Right? Yeah. I mean, just so important. John, how does how does one become a reflective person? What is a description of that reflective person who isn't you know, dour and trying to taint everything with hardship and overemphasis on life is hard and my internal angst is the reality. How do you become a person who reflects well? My answer surprises me, but here's what just came to my heart. Read the Psalms. Mm -hmm. Read the Psalms. Like if you want to explore emotional health, realistic living, kind of clarity and not living in denial. Read the Psalms Mm -hmm. because some of them are absolute joy and it's rejoicing. Life is good and praise God for it. Man, when you're in one of those seasons, give thanks. That's awesome. But that's not all the Psalms and they encompass the whole breadth of, of human experience. The other thing that occurs to me, Paul says something very interesting in, in one of his letters. He says, I judge myself so that the Lord doesn't have to judge me. I discipline myself so that God doesn't have to discipline me. There's a choice. There's a choice that Mm -hmm. has to be made of I'm simply choosing not to be a naive person. Mm -hmm. I'm choosing not to turn a blind eye to the fact that while I want to say my relationships are great, they're actually not. Mm -hmm. That choice so that... Or because then God will have to bring the rain, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, he doesn't want us in a foolish naivete. He doesn't want us in a false peace and comfort. So he'll bring disruption. I mean, that's Paul's perspective is either we become reflective or God brings suffering so that we'll face it. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, life is good. Ultimately, living in a larger story and knowing this is the partial and we have the hope of heaven and knowing Christ in some deep and profound way is the anchor of our very being, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what's raging around us. But it's a life that is good, uh, that acknowledges (laughs) the realities surrounding it, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And choices, Craig. Okay. So time for some just confession that I think will help our listeners. Like last night, I'm exhausted from a long day. I just want the evening to be relief, Mm -hmm. whatever form relief comes, watching a college basketball game, having a little extra dessert, turning on some music and checking out, Mm -hmm. you know. And I was so aware of God's invitation of, hey, come spend some time with me. And I was aware of, I have a choice to make here. I can have an evening that looks like peace, but frankly, it's just narcissism. It's just indulgence. I'm checking out. It's not the same thing as peace, right? right? Especially because the immediate invitation was, oh, man, I don't know if I want to go spend time with God. Mm -hmm. Like That requires something of me. So, friends, choices like that, like where do you go for comfort? Where do you go for peace? I'm also just aware of, you know, some difficult relationships in our world right now. And frankly, everything in me wants to bail. Like that's easy. That, yeah. That's a no-brainer, you know. And I could have peace. I really could. I, man, I could actually have a ton of peace in my life if I just cut off six or seven relationships that are draining and demanding. And so – these would be categories to think in. Like, where do you go for comfort? Yeah. And how do you handle tension? And it's kind of your posture of, hey, if things are hard, I'm gone. Yes. You know, whether that's a church or a small group or a friendship, you know, hey, if I'm not feeling good, 
I know how to take care of that. And it's food, drink, sex, you know, it's watching television. It's a couple more hours of, you know, vegging in front of some movie. Like, are you aware of how you handle... How do you know me? (laughs) You know me. You've just (laughs) exposed me. (laughs) I'm actually thinking of a few Christians I do know as I'm describing that. And they would say, yeah, my life's good. My life's peaceful. And I want to go, sure, because you've made some extraordinarily selfish decisions. Yeah. And both of them also happen to be people who don't fight warfare. No, they just refuse. You know? And so it's like, well, yeah. So you're not in the battle. <laughs> you're totally self-focused. You bail when things get hard. And you call your life blessed or peaceful. What Craig and I are just trying to name is, that's dog squat, yeah. gang. That's not the real deal. And so be very careful how you interpret peace, how you interpret the good life. Yeah. Something just changed a moment ago from us talking about other people. <laughs> In their problems to, oh, my gosh, I'm just thinking what this comes down to is me and what you were describing is I can have comfort, peace, or I can have God. Mm. And it just flipped onto me of how often I'm just like you last night. The goal is comfort. The goal is peace. The goal is life's bitching. Mm -hmm. Ah. Mm -hmm. One of the most popular commercials on the Super Bowl was one that's been dubbed Puppy Love. It's a Budweiser commercial, and it starts off with this darling little – he's either a lab or he's a little golden retriever puppy. But he gets out of the kennel, and he runs over to the farm, and he makes friends with the big Clydesdale horse. And you just get this really cute story. And then boy meets girl, the you know handsome young cowboy. He's got to take the puppy back to the kennel. And it's a attractive young woman, grateful that the puppy's back. And so you get this re- really sweet story, and the puppy keeps getting out. And funny at the end, the last scene is puppy is at the farm to stay. He's with his buddy, the beautiful horse. They're playing in a field while over this beautiful white fence lean the handsome young cowboy and the beautiful young maiden who clearly now have a budding romance. And I looked at that and I went, right, that's what most people are trying to do. I'm in. I'm in. (laughs) Yes. I just wanted to jump up and shout, I understand you had that once, it's coming again, but that cannot be your life goal now. And this will help you so much with interpretation because much of what you are, gang, you know, kind of interpreting as hassles, interruptions, irritating people, interference is is actually battlefronts you're called to engage in, places of redemption you're supposed to bring. And if you're kind of interpreting the blessed life as the comfortable life— Mm-hmm. Wow, that's yeah. that's actually not in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, that's good, John. That's good. So we felt that a conversation in the midst of this interpretation series on how do you interpret the good times? How do you interpret peace? You know, how do you interpret the blessed life? Yeah. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Careful. Yeah. Careful. Don't let your Eden desires and your longing for the coming kingdom cause you to, frankly, live a pretty naive life here Mm -hmm. and just check out Mm -hmm. of things that are hard and justify it as wanting blessedness or something. Don't justify your refusal to fight warfare as, well, I just want to live in the blessedness of God. It's like, (laughs) if you're not shot at, you're not in the battle. Yeah. You know, I think one of the revealing questions is, is what do you do with conflict? Mm -hmm. What do you do with hard things? Is your basic modus operandi eject, Mm -hmm. bail, get out? I mean, just kind of that would be a pretty good indicator, right, of a naive lifestyle. I mean, every relationship has conflict. doesn't mean you bail on the friendship because it's hard right now. Mm -hmm. Now, again, ask Jesus, walk with God. (laughs) This isn't a blanket rule, but... What do you do with conflict? How do you even interpret conflict? Conflict equals bad. Conflict equals God's not blessing me. That would be one. Yeah, I think 
part of that, John, is are you a person who makes the time to find some just still time and just ask Christ, what's going on in my life? How do you see me? What's going on beneath the surface, Lord? Mm-hmm. What are the things that I should be alert or aware of mm. in my world, in my heart? Are you a reflective person? Mm-hmm. And if you're not, that's actually not maturity. Mm-hmm. That's something else, either narcissism or naivete, right? Yeah. Do you hide behind busyness? Mm-hmm. You know? I think another revealing question in this is, where do you go for comfort? Mm-hmm. And how much does any of that have to do with God? Yeah, another thought there, John, is what do you ascribe your success, the peace, the comfort, all the blessings you do have to? Is it God or is it simply the fruits of your hard work, discipline, and character? I've found a way to make life work is usually what's under that. Mm -hmm. Friends, this is an important one, and we understand that actually most of you who would naturally tune into a Ransom Tart podcast are probably a pretty reflective person. But this may have struck some chords in your life. You also may be thinking of people that, man, this just describes to a T. Mm-hmm. Maybe um, burn a copy for them, mm-hmm. you know, give them the CD or, or just refer them to this podcast and say, We think there's something in this for you. Who knows? God might use it in their life. You've been listening to the Ransomed Heart Podcast with John Eldridge and Craig McConnell.